Hi, my name's Drew, and I'm going to be walking you through the Forest River uh, No Boundaries today. Uh, starting right up front here, we're going to go over the loading and unloading procedure. Uh, what that's going to look like is, of course, we have this coupler in the unlocked position when it is straight up and down like that. Uh, from there, we're going to raise the jack uh, three inches above our ball and drop. Uh, we're then, of course, going to center our ball underneath the coupler, uh, lowering the jack back down on top of it, uh, taking the weight off of the jack itself. Uh, once we are fully seated on that ball, we can go ahead and slide this coupler, uh, latch that in the rear position. Uh, we're paying special attention that this secondary latch is, uh, in fact, engaged. I often will give it kind of a yank in the up position there to, to again, uh, just get, make double sure that we are fully latched. Uh, from there, feel free to uh, add an additional pin here through these holes. Uh, you can either use a security pin or a standard spring clip. Uh, again, just to add a secondary safety feature there. Uh, from there, we're gonna go ahead and cross these toe chains underneath the coupler. Now, keep in mind, it is state law in Texas that not only do these chains need to be crossed underneath the coupler, but it is illegal for them to make contact for the pavement with the pavement at any given time. So, uh, skate that line of having enough room to uh, make your turns left or right, but not so much room that these may, uh, again, contact the pavement. Uh, riding right next to those tow chains is going to be our emergency breakaway cable. Now this is a very important piece of safety equipment. This is essentially your last uh, safety, in, in, uh, safety in line. So uh, if your coupler were to fail here, uh, that, that tongue slammed down on those tow chains, broke those chains. Uh, as those two vehicles separate, this is going to act like a ripcord to the electric brake system, essentially pulling the plug back here, putting full 12 volts to that. Uh, to those brakes. Uh, what you're avoiding uh, with this is going to be a, one, a runaway trailer situation. So uh, very important that this has its own separate connection point on the receiver, whether that be uh, carabiner, quick link, uh, whatever, as long as this is connected separate of the tow chains to the receiver, you're gonna be in good shape. Uh, also, uh, is cut very long from the manufacturer. Uh, make sure you do, uh, of course, same rule with the tow chains you have enough room to make your turns left or right, but not so much room that this is going to make contact with the pavement. Uh, we have your seven way plug here. This is going to plug into the corresponding receptacle on your bumper. This is gonna give you full function to your vehicle's charging system, uh, braking system, uh, marker lights, tail lights, things like that. Uh, whenever this is plugged into your vehicle, think of it at that point as one large, uh, one large vehicle. Uh, for all intents and purposes, they are linked together. Uh, jack behind that, again, up or down, easy operation with that. A nice manual jack uh, is going to work well uh, for that loading and unloading process. Uh, hopping up here, we have a 20-pound propane, propane cylinder. Uh, now, this is going to be full for you when you do pick up your unit. Uh, open and close valve on the top, uh, clearly marked in the open and closed position. Uh, I find most people are, are pretty familiar with these tanks. This is the same variant you're going to find on any gas grill. Uh, to service the tank, you're going to go ahead and remove the pigtail here and also loosen this tension band. From there, you can go ahead and pull this tank out and again, take it to get filled, uh, take advantage of any exchange programs. Uh, that's, of course, very much up to you. This is all covered uh, by the propane cover here. Uh, what we're paying attention here is that the hole on the rear of the tank uh, is facing the camper itself. Line it up here with this stud and this wing nut. That's going to go ahead and secure that tank in place, or that, that cover in place, I should say. Uh, that cover is not only going to keep any weather off the, the tank, uh, but will also protect it from road debris and rocks while going down the road. Uh, behind that, we have a brand new Interstate D-Cycle battery. Uh, big thing with this is going to be battery maintenance. What that's going to entail is two or three times a year, we're going to go ahead and remove these vent panels on both sides of the battery. Uh, we're going to inspect the water level and we are going to refill with distilled water as necessary. So uh, very important for the life of the battery that we do maintain that battery level. Uh, also just as important is when the unit is going to be in storage for uh, extended periods of time, we are going to go ahead and physically disconnect these battery terminals. Uh, reason being is because we, uh, with any 12 volt system, you're going to find uh, nominal or phantom draws. Uh, within that system, 
Uh, from the day-to-day -day operation, that's no big deal, uh, but when in storage compounded over weeks or months, uh, they can wear and tear on the uh, battery. So uh, go ahead and disconnect the terminals. Even, even better yet would be pulling the uh, battery out, storing it in a more temperature controlled environment, uh, but you know, not everybody's going to have that option. So just a few points there to speak of. Um, on all four corners of the unit, we're going to have stabilizer jacks. Uh, these ones are forward facing. I'm gonna go ahead and grab this crank handle and demo those for you. Uh, now these are for stabilization, they're not for leveling. Uh, it's very important that we operate them properly to keep them in great shape as the camper ages. Uh, what that means for you is if you're leveling front to back, you're gonna use the hand jack up front. Leveling from left to right is gonna be done with the tires and what's called a leveling kit. So they have a multitude of different options in terms of leveling uh, on the market. Uh, figure out which one works for you. But either way, once we are within three degrees of level, we're then going to run down these stabilizer jacks kind of like landing gear. So uh, of course, line up your crank handle on the stud there. You're gonna come down. You're gonna come down. Oh. Come down, make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more just to sure everything up. Uh, what we're aiming for here is just to stabilize that floor, uh, keep it from, from feeling like you're walking around on a couple tires, uh, but we do not wanna overstress those uh, stabilizer jacks there, just, just not made for it. Uh, moving on here, uh, we have a storage compartment here, main storage compartment. Uh, this is a pass-through compartment, so uh, a, a ton of storage space there. Just keep in mind that anything that we do store forward of the wheels uh, is going to increase your tongue weight, so just keep that in mind. Uh, right here we have your freshwater connection. Uh, what that means for you is if you're doing any boondocking, uh, off-grid camping, somewhere where you're not gonna have full-time access to running water, uh, you're wanna go, gonna wanna go ahead and fill up the tank here. Now this is non-pressurized water. Uh, what that means is that we do need to use that onboard 12 volt water pump to draw that water up from the fixture, or up from the tank to the fixtures. Uh, to fill the tank, we stick a drinking water hose directly here. We fill it up to it overflows. Once we're full, we cap it off. And again, we use that pump to make that water usable from the tank. Now city water, that's the next fitting we're coming to. That's going to be pressurized directly from the line. Uh, more often than not, uh, city water is over pressurized for what these units are rated for. Uh, the working water pressure rating for these units is in between 40 and 75 PSI. Uh, so it's very important that we do not exceed that 75 PSI max. Uh, to make sure that that does not happen, we're gonna use a water pressure regulator. Uh, this, this, this specific water pressure regulator regulates that pressure in between 40 and 50 PSI. Uh, if that happens to not be enough pressure for you, feel free to upgrade to either an adjustable water pressure regulator or a high flow uh, regulator. Either way, those all are going to hook on as close to the water source as possible, and then your hose onto that, and finally hooking your uh, connection here uh, hooking onto the trailer connection here by actually rotating that connection. So very easy to accomplish. Uh, very, very important that we always run a regulator uh, that's going to, uh, you know, keep you from overloading that plumbing. Uh, any place with an RV aisle will, will sell water pressure regulators. Uh, if, that, if this one were to, to get lost, damaged, uh, just make sure you go ahead and replace it uh, before uh, taking the unit out again. Uh, if we get down low here, um, we see not only these two uh, water lines here, but there's going to be one further back, and I'm not sure if you can see that on camera, uh, but what that, that one further back is going to be your freshwater tank drain. So that's how we're going to drain your potable water tank. And then the two closer to us are going to be your low point drains. Now the manufacturer recommends that anytime the unit is gonna be in storage for more than seven days, that it is very important that we purge all the water from the system. Uh, to do that, we're going to remove the plugs from those three locations. The freshwater tank, if it's been in use, and then the low point drains to, join, to drain all of that in between plumbing. So uh, those, those low point drains are the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. Everything in between water source and fixture is going to be drained from that location. Again, anytime the unit is gonna be in storage for more than seven days, very important that we do go ahead and drain those locations. 
Uh, last, to finish up that draining procedure and make the unit ready for storage, we're going to uh, finish up with your water heater here. Now this is a six gallon capacity dual source water heater. Uh, what that means for you is that you can run that either on a, a standalone 110 volt electricity or propane gas with 12 volt direct spark ignition. Uh, other than operation, which we're going to cover here in just a few minutes, uh, just like I previously mentioned, the manufacturer has a, a couple of specific recommendations. Uh, number one, uh, draining the unit, like I said, if it is going to be in storage for more than seven days. And number two, priming it or refilling that water tank before returning the unit to service. Uh, so when it does come to draining it, it's, it's very important from a safety standpoint that we follow uh, these directions to a T. Uh, that's going to keep you from injuring yourself, scalding yourself, things like that. So uh, number one, give the, give the water heater ample time to cool down, uh, at least two or three hours. Uh, once you are certain of the temperature, we're going to make sure we cut the inflow of water to the unit completely. So uh, again, just to, just to kind of bring it full circle, if we're uh, hooked up to city water connection here, we're gonna go ahead and turn the valve off at the water source. Uh, if we are utilizing the fresh water connection here, we're gonna turn that 12 volt water pump off. So with no new water flowing into the unit completely, uh, we are then set to depressurize the unit. What we're gonna do there is we're going to uh, find any water fixture within the unit, whether that's an outside shower, whether that's the kitchen sink, bathroom sink, any of those will do. We're going to turn the hot side of any of those fixtures on. Uh, you're going to see a little bit of water come from the fixture. Uh, once that water ceases to come from the uh, fixture itself, that means that that, that means that that, that this unit itself is depressurized. Uh, from there, we can safely drain it. Uh, without having any issue. So uh, once we've done those things, we're going to come down here with an inch and a sixteenth socket and extension, and we're going to go ahead and back that drain plug out. Uh, once we've backed that drain plug out, the remaining four or five gallons uh, that we still have within the, the unit itself are going to evacuate from this location here. Uh, once we've done so, we can go ahead and, and replace the drain plug, uh, or, you know, replace the drain plug, and then we are, as long as we've uh, done the low point drains in the freshwater tank, we are ready to store the unit. So on the flip side of that conversation, manufacturer recommends to refilling the unit or, or priming the unit before use. Uh, that process is going to look very similar. Uh, you, instead of, of um, you know, cutting the water uh, here, uh, we are going to introduce water to the inlet of the unit. So uh, city water, we're going to turn on the valve. Uh, fresh water, we're going to turn on the water pump. With fresh water running into the unit, uh, we are then going to again go to the hot side of that spigot or fixture on the inside. We're going to turn that on. Uh, now initially that flow is going to be very airy, very bubbly. Uh, what it's doing is it's displacing the, the air that is within the unit and replacing it with water. So once we see that flow normalize at the fixture, that is our indicator that we do have six gallons of water within the unit. We are safe to go ahead and choose our source. Uh, as I mentioned previously, this is a dual source water heater. Uh, if we're trying to run it on a 110 volt electricity, we're going to do that right on the unit itself. That toggle switch is right behind uh, the regulator here. And it is clearly marked on off. And that is again going to be for the 110 volt, uh, 110 volt element. Now, if we're going to use the propane heat, the propane side of things, uh, you're going to find that on the inside of the unit. Uh, we'll get to the location of that switch um, when we get there. Uh, it is possible to run the unit on both sources. That is going to give you the highest recharge rate. Uh, both sources are going to be 17 gallons per hour. Uh, standalone propane is going to be uh, 15 gallons per hour. And lastly, that electric element is going to be somewhere around 11 gallons per hour. Uh, the biggest limitation or recommendation I can make when using uh, that 110 volt element is make sure that you turn it off when you're done using it. Uh, I have found that uh, because of kind of the peculiar location of the switch that people can forget to turn that off uh, when they're done using it and then ultimately draining it. Uh, what you're creating there is going to be a dry fire scenario, uh, which will, a dry fire scenario, which, uh, which is heating the 
heating the unit up without any water in it. Of course, it's, it's not great for the uh, appliance. You can actually break the appliance by doing so. Uh, so we want to avoid that at all costs. Uh, other than, than that long-winded explanation, uh, it is very important that we do keep mud daubers and flying insects from nesting within the appliance. Uh, those flying insects are attracted to the smell of propane. So what that means is uh, they crawl within these louvers, within this grating. Uh, they make their way as deep as, as, as deep as they can within the appliance. Uh, again, generally leaving it inoperable when they're done. So uh, they do make specifically cut screens, not only for the water heater, uh, but for all of the propane appliances. And again, it is very important that we do um, make sure uh, that we do put those in place to keep those uh, insects from nesting within the appliance. Uh, right here we have your slide out. It's a good time to talk about slide out maintenance. Um, these units, they use the Schwintex system. Uh, what that means for you is you have two tracks, top to bottom, left to right. You have two independently geared motors pushing that slide in and out. It's very important that we do lubricate these slides uh, once every 90 days. Uh, what we're going to use to do so is a dry silicone lubricant, a PTFE lubricant, uh, and that process is going to be spraying the track down directly, running that slide in and out a couple times to distribute that lubricant, and we're going to be good for the next 90 days. Now also on that same procedure, it's very important that we uh, lubricate these seals as well or condition those seals. We're going to use a separate product, which is an RV grade seal conditioner. Uh, generally, uh, of course, number one, follow the recommendations on the can, but generally that process is spraying them down, uh, wiping any excess, uh, letting them soak in for a bit, and that's it. You're good again for the next 90 days. Now keep in mind you have two separate sets of seals. You not only have this seal that wraps uh, all the way around the slide out, but since that slide out seals in both directions, you have, um, you have seals on the inside as well. So keep that in mind. We're gonna, going to make sure we're treating both sets of seals. Uh, moving on here, uh, brings us to our tires and our, our lug nuts. Uh, now lug nuts have been torqued to 100 foot pounds here in the shop. Uh, manufacturer recommends a retorque procedure. Uh, generally those numbers are the first 15, 25, 50, and 100 miles of initial travel. It is very important that we check and make sure that those lug nuts are remaining, uh, maintaining that 100 foot pounds of torque. Uh, from there on out, the manufacturer recommends at the start of each trip that you go ahead and check and make sure they are again maintaining that 100 foot pounds of torque. Uh, with tire pressure, we run all trailer tires at the max tire pressure rating. Uh, you'll find that information not only stamped on the sidewall of the tire itself, but also on the data tag here on the front of the unit. Uh, what we have here is going to be a 65 PSI max tire pressure rating. And again, that's gonna give us the highest flexibility in terms of weight rating. Whether we are completely full or completely empty, that 65 PSI is gonna be a good number. Uh, moving on here, uh, we have your cable satellite inlet here. So that's just a standard RG6 cable fitting. Uh, that's going to pass through to the designated TV areas of the camper that allows you to feed either a park cable service or an aftermarket satellite package uh, to the unit. Again, a standard cable fitting, a standard RG6 cable fitting, um, very much like you would hook onto your television. Uh, below that, we have your 30 amp, 110 volt power supply. This is your cord, comes with the unit, it's 30 feet in length, is only going to plug into the camper one way. Uh, if I go ahead and un undo this, we have one L-shaped receptacle. We're going to line that up with the L-shaped prong, uh, plug it straight in from there. That's going to, uh, once we're fully inserted, we give it an eighth inch trencher to the right, that locks it in. Then we do have a secondary collar here to screw down and lock it in further to make it more secure. Now for every single unit that I deliver, I absolutely recommend the addition of a 30 amp surge protector. Uh, those surge protectors plug directly into the, uh, directly to the power source and your cord in line with that. Uh, it's very important that we do protect what we have on the inside of the unit, which is going to be a lot of sensitive electronics. Uh, it's very important that we protect them not only from substandard wiring, dirty power, but surges as well. The only way to effectively do that is going to be putting a surge protector in line. If you have any questions, uh, if you have any questions on the products that we recommend uh, or, on, or on how to use them, uh, feel free to give our parts department a call. They would be more than happy to go ahead and walk you through that. 
uh, and educate you a little further uh, on the operation of those. Down below here, uh, we have your dump valve. Now this is a standard bayonet style dump valve. Uh, your sewage hose is going to connect the very same way this cap comes off. What that means is you have four prongs along the uh, exterior of that tube. We're going to line this keyhole up in the halfway. We're going to give it a quarter turn to the right. That's going to lock it on and that will allow us uh, to be ready for service. Now one thing, we have uh, your dump valves here. You have black for black water and gray for gray water. Now black water is going to be anything that comes from the uh, toilet. Gray water is going to be anything that comes from the sink or the shower. It's very important that we keep this black water valve in the closed position during use. Uh, we're going to use the monitor panel on the inside and we're only going to dump as necessary. Uh, reason being is we have of course solid body waste, we have toilet paper, we have that inside the tank. Uh, we want to make sure that it easily evacuates that tank when we pull that valve and the only way to do that is to keep it in as wet or flowing condition as we can. So keep that valve in the closed position. The only times you're going to dump is either when the, the monitor panel on the inside tells you the tank is full or you're changing location. So it's not, I recommend not carrying uh, waste with you. It's not going to do any favors for you. Gray water right beside that, as we spoke of, that's going to be sink, shower, sink water, uh, shower water, relatively cleaner of the two. Uh, a, common, a common thing that people do is they go ahead and they dump their black water valve. They then close that black water valve once it's been evacuated, and then they use that gray water to go ahead and rinse that shared plumbing, as well as their sewage hose on the way out. Uh, that's a fantastic way of operating these, a very popular option. Uh, just keep in mind that these two valves should never be open at the same time. You're going to want to avoid any cross-contamination or backfeeding issues by doing so. So keep them, uh, operate one at a time uh, and, and make, sure, uh, make sure you keep that, that black water valve in the closed position. All right, so here we have your outside shower. Uh, this is going to give you access to hot and cold water. Uh, it's a very functional item here. Uh, does is very self-contained. The sprayer and the nozzle, or the sprayer and the hose are going to wrap around the fixture uh, and store within the unit itself. Uh, this is also a great location when it does come to depressurizing the water heater and then of course refilling it. Uh, this is a great location to uh, accomplish that at uh, because uh, of course it's on the outside. You don't have to go inside and use those fixtures. So what we have here is going to be your rooftop ladder access. Uh, that is going to bring me to a great point, uh, which is going to be structural maintenance. Uh, what that's going to entail for you is anywhere where two pieces come together, they are going to use some sort of sealant. Uh, it is our goal to inspect that sealant every 90 days and touch up as necessary. Uh, what that's going to entail there on the roof, what they're going to use up there is going to be an RV grade uh, self-leveling lap sealant. Uh, generally what we're looking for is any degradation in those sealants, whether that's cracking, peeling, uh, separation of any kind. Uh, on the roof, we're going to do some spot sealing. Uh, again, that's self-leveling, so you kind of apply that heavily uh, and let that kind of settle out. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the body of the camper, we're going to use a 100% silicone product. Uh, you can either source that from any hardware store, or pick it up from your RV dealer while you're sourcing your lap sealant. And again, you're going to touch up that bead if you see any degradation uh, within that bead. Uh, also here on the rear, we have your tube storage bumper. Uh, that's going to accommodate sewage hoses, things like that. Any long storage can be stored uh, within the bumper. It does have a cap on each side that is removable. And then we also have a full-size spare tire here. Uh, when it does come to changing a tire on the unit, uh, number one, the unit does not come with its own jack and it does not come with its own lug wrench. So make sure that the uh, jack and lug wrench that accompanies your tow vehicle uh, is going to also accommodate you in changing a tire uh, with the unit. Uh, now, placement of the jack is going to be on the axle as close to the tire as you can get it without it interfering in your work. Um, make sure that you are following all other uh, rules of thumb, if you will, when it does come to changing a tire. So make sure you're, it's safe to do so. Uh, and, and yeah, so, so just keep that in mind. Uh, we also have your black tank flush here. Now this corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank. 
uh, specifically designed to help blast off compounded toilet waste, body waste, things like that. Uh, we're of course going to use our own separate water hose for this. Uh, that's an excellent feature. I recommend you uh, using it every single time you dump that tank. That is again going to help uh, not only keep those sensors nice and clean, it's gonna help with any compounding of that toilet waste and body waste, and it's just gonna keep everything nice and clean. So uh, what that process looks like is we hook up again a, a separate uh, hose to this. We allow that water to rush in. While that water's rushing in, we're going to be on the inside of the unit, and we're gonna be ins inspecting that tank monitor watching that tank fill up. Uh, once it reaches about two thirds full, we're then going to run outside of the unit. We're gonna run over to the black water valve and we're gonna relieve that pressure. It's very important that we stay diligent when we are utilizing this black tank flush uh, because if that tank overflows, that, piece, that path of least resistance is going to be the rooftop septic vents and that water will uh, terminate there. So it is very important that you are watching that monitor panel you're making sure that you are using this correctly uh, because you, of course, want to make sure that you uh, don't overflow that tank. So moving on here to the other side here, or the passenger side, uh, we're going to uh, make our way here to the refrigerator compartment. Uh, from a maintenance standpoint, this is not going to carry very much of that. Uh, there's just not generally not much that you have to do. Uh, it is a pretty, it stays in pretty good shape. Uh, Give it a visual inspection here in this compartment a couple times a year, make sure nothing's gotten in. Uh, of course, this is also a propane burning appliance, so we wanna make sure that we are protecting it from the intrusion of mud divers and flying insects. Uh, we're going to do so by uh, using those aftermarket bug screens and covering these openings up again to prevent that intrusion. Uh, other than that, all your controls are going to be on the inside of the unit. Uh, just give it a visual inspection a couple times a year and we'll be good to go. Uh, when it does come to, uh, to, to uh, putting this vent in place or removing it, uh, we're going to line up the tabs there on the bottom first. We're going to swing that up, make sure that uh, we're, our locking tabs are in place. When everything is sitting flush, we can go ahead and finish locking them up by giving these a quarter turn. Uh, I always go back after the fact, uh, give it a pull, make sure it is in fact locked on. So many of these have been lost going down the road uh, because of improper installation. Down below here, we have your furnace. That is also a propane burning appliance that you use also going to use 12 volt direct spark ignition, uh, as well as a 12 volt blower motor. Uh, again, not, not, a, not what we would consider a customer serviceable unit. Not much that you're going to be doing from this location. This is the exhaust, so uh, of course, let it exhaust. Uh, it does blow very hot air when it is on. Uh, don't restrict the flow, don't put a lawn chair up in front of it. Uh, other than that, put a bug screen in place, make sure we're not running into those intrusion uh, issues that we've also already talked about uh, with those flying insects. Uh, moving on, we have a couple 110 volt all weather outlets, uh, just some 15 amp outlets, nothing too crazy there. Uh, they'll allow you to plug in any appliances here on the rear, uh, you know, to, to efficiently use this as a, a kind of porch space or whatever. Um, screen door is going to lock against uh, the main entry door and our steps are going to uh, operate uh, like so. So of course they stow up here like this when going down the road. Of course the door is closed. You open the door, you pull this locking tab back and that will allow you to go ahead and bring those down. Uh, very easy to use. Uh, you do have to make sure that the door is fully open uh, or that the, they will get kind of hung up on the door frame. All right, so here we have your hood vent. Uh, this is a pressure fit here. Uh, it's very important that we go ahead and make sure we open that up uh, before cooking a meal there on the cooktop so that um, that, that smoke and, and heat is exhausted from the area. And it's also important that we do close it uh, before going down the road. That's going to keep any uh, any road debris uh, or weather from, from coming in from that location. Uh, we also have an adjustable handrail here. Uh, very easy, it locks in the out position. You can go ahead and lift it up, fold it against the body. Uh, oftentimes people like to fold it against the door. Uh, whichever uh, you prefer is up to you. Uh, awning, porch lights, things like that. We're gonna get to the operation of those there on the inside. 
Uh, they are all switched on the inside. They're very simple. We're going to get to that when we go to the inside. Uh, and then we have the other side of your main storage compartment here. Uh, again, nothing uh, really that we need to talk about, but that is going to be the location there. Uh, I believe that covers it here for the exterior of the unit. We're going to go hop on the inside and take a look at those features. So here on the interior of the unit, first up we have your uh, uh, fire extinguisher. Uh, now it's very important that we test all of our safety equipment every single time we take the unit out. Uh, to do so with the fire extinguisher, we're going to push this green tab down. If it springs back, that means we have life within the unit. If not, uh, if it stays depressed, it's time to uh, pull that unit out and replace. Uh, also, uh, here uh, on the bed, uh, we have your GFI protected outlet. Now, all the receptacles within this unit are on the same circuit. This is going to be the reset point for all of those. Uh, in the event that one gets overloaded, they all kind of follow suit, uh, and that's where we're going to reset them. Uh, now, this is going to be your porch light switch. We saw that light on the exterior front uh, of the unit, uh, and that's going to be the location uh, for that light there. Now this switch over here, that's going to be for, um, for the under lighting in the kitchen area. Uh, very straightforward. Uh, just going to light that kind of spice rack uh, location there. We have a couple USBs here. Those are 12 volt appliances. So you'll have access to charge your devices off grid. Uh, coming up further, uh, we have your interior light switch here. Uh, we go ahead and hit that. That's going to bring on most of these lights overhead. Uh, each light has its own switch though, so we have ultimate control over which ones come on uh, with that switch and which ones don't. Uh, porch light here. Uh, now that's actually going to be a three-way switch. If we go up on that switch, that's going to be a bright white LED. If we go down on that switch, that's going to be an amber colored light. Uh, middle is going to be uh, off. Awning lights, that's going to be the LED lights there on the awning rail. And we can see those outside. And then we have your slide in and out switch here. Uh, very important that we talk about the operation of that. Uh, first off, uh, of course, looking at that space, uh, that table needs to be out of the way, as well as these uh, cushions here. Now those all lift up. You can store the table on that uh, sofa and those cushions as well. So those need to be out of the way. Uh, also, it's very important to mention that a slide needs to come fully in and go fully out. Being that it is two independently geared motors, it can actually bind in its opening. So it is very important, again, that we're bringing that fully in uh, till it stops, fully out till it stops. Uh, and then we have your awning extend and retract here. Uh, that's a momentary switch. Uh, we go ahead and press that. That awning is going to come right in. Uh, you're going to hold it until you take your... Uh, you're going to hold it until it comes in and then you take your hand off the switch. It's very important to note the orientation of the fabric here on the awning rail. It should always be on top of the awning rail uh, as opposed to the bottom. Uh, if it is on the bottom, that means at some point you have rolled in your awning backwards uh, and it's inside out essentially. So you need to, to, to bring it all the way out and then, then bring it in correctly. Um, Moving on here into the, the, the bed area, we of course have your television set here. Uh, on the roof, we're going to find a, excuse me, a, 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 a omnidirectional digital over the air television antenna. That is powered by that switch that I turned on. As long as that red light's on and we go ahead and do a channel search within the menu functions of the television, that's gonna go ahead and bring in the best case uh, scenario in terms of, of digital programming. Um, and that should work well. Generally, we can pull in channels from Waco here, uh, and that, that works out very well for us. Uh, when going down the road, this needs to be in the locked position. You're going to use this buckle to do so, and essentially, uh, let me see if I can get this seated properly. It's gonna be something like that. Uh, latching that there, making sure that's secure. That's gonna keep that from bouncing around uh, when going down the road. Uh, light switch here is going to be for these back cabinet lights. It's a cool feature. It looks very nice, uh, but that is controlled right here uh, on that switch. And then these lights are going to have, again, their own switches on off is going to be the center of the lens. Uh, we have cup holders, 110 volt, out, uh, 110 volt um, outlet here uh, at the bed. 
Uh, TV remote down there within the storage cubby. This is all very basic, kind of usual suspect kind of stuff. Um, storage on the underside of the bed. Uh, tons and tons of, tons of storage there. Uh, coming here into this area. Now, this is a secondary sleeping area. This is going to make a, a secondary bed. Uh, to do so, we're going to go ahead and lower the table. Uh, it's easy if you kind of pull this out into the common area of the camper. And uh, it has, let me see if I can turn this around so you can actually see what's going on here. So we have this little yellow tab. We need to unlock that tab there. And then I like to put my foot on the table because it kind of takes a lot of pressure to make it collapse. And then it folds to the side and then down and kind of in. So with that, that done, we slide that into that space there. And then we take these rear cushions we arrange that, or we, those, those, rear, those cushions on the rear of the sofa and we rearrange them over top of this tabletop to fill out that mattress. Uh, and again, makes a very uh, large secondary sleeping area for a full-sized adult. Uh, works very well. Uh, here in the kitchen area, um, of course your storage up here, uh, nothing too crazy there. Uh, very large stainless steel sink, which is, this is epic, uh, an epic sink. Generally, they're not this large, so it's really cool to have that. Uh, cooktop here, uh, kind of your standard basic style cooktop. Uh, you're going to, of course, need a long stem barbecue to actually light these burners. To do so, you're gonna turn that to light. You're gonna hold your flame directly on the burner uh, till, of course, you see that flame there. Now, it is very important that we uh, give those burners ample time to cool down after use before we close this tempered glass cooktop. I've seen these come back broken. Uh, because of the, the customer neglected to, use, to do so. Uh, now it goes without saying, this is not a cooktop, this is not a griddle, this is just a countertop extender. It just makes this space more usable when preparing a meal or uh, when not using the stove itself. Uh, light here, fan, uh, exhaust fan. Again, make sure we're opening that uh, hood vent there on the outside. Uh, we have your uh, cooktop here or your excuse me we have your uh, three-way microwave that's going to be a, a convection oven a microwave oven as well as a grill uh, we have multiple different ways of using this it, it has a heating element on the top uh, you can use it like a toaster oven these work exceptionally well uh, when it comes to controlling them it's going to be very indicative of what you typically see with a microwave uh, your sources are going to be on the top of that panel. You're going to choose time and temperature there on the numbers. Uh, if you can work a microwave, you can of course work your way around this. Uh, down here we have your 12-volt uh, blower motor. That's going to be for your furnace. That's where all your heat's going to come from. Uh, works very well in this space. Uh, you don't need a ducted furnace or anything like that. Uh, that's going to push your heat uh, throughout the unit. Uh, and is going to be, uh, you're going to have no issues controlling temperature within the unit. Uh, we have your refrigerator here. Now we have your main on off switch. It goes through a kind of like a little boot up procedure. Uh, from there we have uh, really just one mode button. So your standard operation is going to be an auto. Uh, and that's denoted by that orange light there. If I go ahead and I depress that gas switch, that's going to send us into that gas mode. So in the auto mode, it defaults to AC voltage first. If it does not find AC voltage, it automatically switches and starts lighting off of gas. Uh, in standalone gas mode, of course, there is no automatic switch over to electricity. Uh, there is no real indicator that you are running in gas mode other than the orientation of the switch. Uh, if it fails to light in that gas mode, it's gonna illuminate this check light. So very, very basic, very easy uh, system to use. Now we have uh, this these latch locks here, so we just push on that button that allows us to go ahead and open the doors for either one uh, Hopping over here to the bunk area, of course we have the bunks uh, Not really much to need, needs to be said about those up top there. We have your 9 volt smoke alarm uh, That's going to of course run on a 9 volt battery. You'll test it as such very easy to use uh, My recommendation is going to be keeping a spare 9 volt battery for you uh, I absolutely do not recommend removing that battery at any time. So if that starts alerting to you that the battery is low, very important to go ahead and replace that battery. So make sure you have a spare uh, in case it's like 
at 3 a.m. Uh, we have your Dometic thermostat here. Um, now this is going to be a captive touch thermostat, which means these buttons aren't physical buttons. They're kind of like touch screen. Uh, when we go ahead and push the panel there, uh, we do need to choose a fan speed first. So our choices are low, high, and auto. If we go to either low and high, that air conditioner fan is going to run indefinitely whether or not it reaches that temperature that we've set with the thermostat. To keep that corresponding with the, the mode that we're selecting as well as um, a thermostat at temperature, we're going to keep that in auto. So we have to choose a, a fan speed before we go on. We choose auto. Uh, that takes us into that air conditioner mode. We have that cool uh, denoted by the snowflake there. Auto is going to be that fan speed. 65 degrees is that thermostat. To change that temperature, again, we come up or down here on the arrows. If I hit that one more time, oh, if I hit that one more time, that's going to take us into that furnace mode. If I go ahead and, and uh, were to exceed the temperature that, that within the unit, that's going to kick that blower motor on immediately. 16 seconds after that, it actually ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. In a unit of this size, I would not be surprised if it sets off the smoke alarm when you do go ahead and set that to furnace. Uh, per manufacturer's recommendations, that is totally acceptable. Uh, what happens is when it first starts, uh, as it runs, it takes about 15 minutes, that efficiency rating goes up, it should stop to set off that, stop setting off that smoke alarm. Again, I don't, I don't recommend removing that battery uh, at all. So, so that's just gonna be something you're gonna have to contend with. Uh, down low here on the floor, we have your carbon monoxide LP leak detector. Uh, that is wired into the 12 volt section of the camper. So uh, you don't have to worry about changing any batteries, although it does have a test button on it and it functions very much like a smoke alarm. It's going to let you uh, know any gases it may be sensing, whether that's going to be a carbon monoxide leak uh, or a propane gas leak, it will let you know. Again, test button on the appliance. Uh, make sure we're testing it every single time we take the unit out. Uh, moving on here into the restroom. Um, first up, we have um, your light switch, very basic, very easy. Uh, but we also have your courtesy panel right beside that. Uh, now this is going to give you a real-time readout of where your tanks as well as your batteries sit uh, in level of full. Uh, the more lights we see here on the display means the more full your tank is. Uh, battery reads full. Battery is going to read full anytime you are plugged into shore power. So to get a true readout of where your battery sits, we unplug from shore power and then we test here at this location. Uh, fresh water is full. That's how we do our testing within these units. We pressurize the system with the 12 volt water pump uh, and bring that water from the tank, make sure there's no leaks in the system. Uh, black water is empty as it should be. Gray water is empty as it should be. Uh, we have your water pump switch here. Of course, the red light means you're on. And then we have your water heater switch next to that. Uh, now, if I flip on this water heater and it's not already up to temperature like it is right now, this fault light's gonna come on with that water heater. You're going to see that, uh, you're gonna see that fault light turn on and off while the, the unit goes through its lighting procedure. If you come back five minutes later and that light is still on, that means the water heater did not light. Uh, reason being, a uh, couple of different things may be happening. Uh, either you're out of propane gas, either you don't have the valve or the service valve on top of the tank on, uh, or, you know, dependent on the size of the unit, it may just take a few tries for that, that gas to make its way to the line, through the line to the appliance. Of course, this floor plan doesn't really lend itself to that being an option, but it could happen. So uh, if, if you come back five minutes later, that red light's on, of course, make sure you have propane in the tank, make sure that valve is in the on position, and then we can go ahead and turn that switch off, turn it back on, let that recycle as long as we've corrected the issue uh, it should have no problems lighting on the first try of that second cycle. Uh, flush, toilet flush, it's going to be a pedal. Uh, light press on the pedal to fill up the bowl with water, full press to flush. Uh, of course, very important that we use a single ply RV grade toilet paper as well as a uh, deodorizing product and a tissue dissolver. Now, ultimately you're going to follow, uh, again, the, the manufacturer of those products uh, directions in terms of use, uh, but generally you're going to, with all of those products, you're going to introduce them here uh, directly at the toilet. 
and generally you're going to go ahead and chase them with a, a, a certain amount of water. Uh, that will be all you do while using the camper and then once you dump you're going to kind of restart that process. Now it's my recommendation that while you're storing the unit that you do go ahead and store it with chemical in the tank. Uh, that's going to uh, again help really deodorize things while in storage. That's going to help kind of break down any compounding that may be happening at the bottom of the tank. Uh, while that's kind of like sitting in the sun baking on it's just going to keep things nice and fresh. Uh, as fresh as, as that system could be. So, uh, other than that, uh, you know, nothing really crazy here. We have uh, medicine cabinet, sink fixture, things like that. If I come up here above my head, we have your uh, exhaust fan. Uh, now this locks, so we pull down on that crank handle. That will allow us to go ahead and open that. It is directionalized. Um, so once we uh, open that up, we can go ahead and turn it on here. We have four, span, four fan speeds generally, and then we have an on off button there. Now make sure that we close this before going down the road. It is very important. Uh, something you'll only forget once because it's probably not gonna be there when you get to where you're going. Uh, once, we, once we close it, we push up on that knob that's going to lock it into place, and then we're ready to go down the road. Uh, here in the shower, uh, of course, a very basic kind of shower setup. We, of course, have hot and cold here at the fixture. Uh, if I come up here to the shower head, uh, we have an on off there on the actual head. Uh, that's in the name of water uh, conservation. That will keep you from using uh, not only your six gallon uh, hot water capacity, but your overall uh, holding water holding tank water. So uh, generally you'll find yourself doing military Navy style showers within the unit. Uh, again, in the name of water conservation. So, uh, Shower curtain is on a magnet that just latches there. Uh, again, really nothing too, too out of the realm there. I believe that just about covers it here for the uh, Forest River Novo. If you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to give us a call. We'd be happy to kind of uh, revisit a lot of these things. We hope you enjoyed this walkthrough. Thank you very much.